Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video. Myself and Marta, I hope you all have been enjoying the wonderful weather. It is very, very hot here today, so you're going to have to excuse the fan running in the background. I would probably die if I tried to turn it off. So we've got quite a few things to talk about today. And I'm going to start things off with a little bit of gaming news regarding that game Hades that you may recall from a while back. In case you missed it, I did do a first impressions review of this game, which is currently still in early access only on the Epic Games Store at the moment. You will find a link to my video in the description below. If you want to go give it a watch, I would suggest you do so. It is a very cool game. So, at the moment, as I said, it is only on the Epic Games Store, but it does seem it will be coming to Steam. That's according to the Steam page, which was posted a couple of days ago and was spotted by the keen-eyed folks over at Resetera. So, basically, it's going to be coming to Steam on December the 10th. So, is it still going to be in early access at that point? It's hard to tell, but it probably is going to be complete when it comes out on Steam, just because it makes sense. But it is very possible it's just going to come out in early access, but in a different state to what it currently is on the Epic Games Store. I haven't played this in quite some time, and I am curious to see how it has improved, because it, obviously the problem with early access is you see it in its sort of rough and ready state. It, you don't really want to play too much of it, at least in my opinion, because I want to enjoy it when it's actually finished, when it's got all the polish and all the niggles sorted out. So I'm going to have a little look, but I'm most likely going to wait for it to come out. But really pleased it's coming out on Steam. This is a great game by one of my favourite studios, so it definitely deserves some love. Go check it out uh, if you're at all curious. So next up we're going to discuss a few things from Toshiba, who had quite a bit to say at the Flash Memory Summit this year. So they discuss numerous things as I just said, and the first of which that I'm going to touch on is the fact that they are already begun planning the fifth through this to the seventh generation of Bix Flash. And unsurprisingly, each of the new generations is going to be accompanied by a new generation of PCIe standard. So obviously we're going to be getting Bix 5 that's going to be PCIe 4, and then obviously we're going to be seeing the iterations go up alongside the PCI standards. Now we do know that BIX5 will have a higher bandwidth of 1200 MT2 and BIX6 will have 1600 and BIX7 will have 2000. So nice little improvement in that regard on each step. So it, they also have started research into something by the name of Pentalevel Cell, NAND Flash or PLC to give it a bit more of a uh, memorable name and actually verified working 5-bit per cell NAND by modifying what they currently have, which of course is QLC. So it does come with its own challenges, of course, but if they manage to work out the issues of the voltage levels required, it does have quite a bit more capacity than the current QLC. But outside of this, they are of course trying to increase die density in Bix Flash in all of its forms. So they're not just focusing on one area here, they're trying to solve that all important density problem across all of their different technologies. Obviously, this one PLC may not work out for some time given the challenges that it faces, but still really, really cool to see Toshiba working on something that's going to address a problem that's kind of been hanging around for quite a while because QLC is fairly slow and has low endurance and other types of flash as well. Last thing I want to touch on that they discussed at the event was their data center or enterprise PCIe for SSDs. They are the very first company to announce a publicly demo data center SSDs for this market. It is built using 96 layer BIX for flash and will have clocks, speed, sorry, should I say, I thought it kind of clutched on itself there, of 6.7 gigabytes of sequential throughput. Again, this is for data center, so unfortunately this shiny is not for you or me, but it is more built for cloud computing, CDNs, database applications, and so on and so forth. But still, really nice to see, and I've spoken before about this one of the most interesting areas of technology where something that's not necessarily intended for us, we'll still have sort of ripple effects elsewhere in the industry, and it's still cool to see new technologies being developed, even if it isn't for the particular segment that I myself am a consumer of. But we're gonna move on from that to some updates regarding Radeon 7. So, you may recall back in July, early July in fact, I discussed the reports that was doing the rounds from the French media outlet Calcotland, which basically said, that Radeon 7 was already end of life, even though at that point it had not been out long at all. The reason for this, as I discussed in that video, is fairly obvious. The RX 5700 and XT exist. 
And while it does do better in compute, Radeon 7 was very much a stopgap GPU in between the previous generation and of course the current one which is Navi. And now we have a bit of an update to this because AMD did say no, no it's not. But now we have a statement from Matt Buck of Puget Systems who Paul actually interviewed way back in the day. Not him specifically but they, he did go down to Puget Systems and interview a fellow there so go check that interview out. And basically said that an AMD rep said to them that Radeon 7 is indeed end of life. And he said, quote, Radeon 7 is 100% EOL. We confirmed that directly with AMD before we started this round of GPU testing. Leftover supply does not mean it's still being manufactured. And AMD has neither confirmed nor denied this. Uh, report, so the response, sorry, should I say, says, quote, we expect Radeon 7 availability will continue to meet demands for the foreseeable future, yada, yada, yada. And... That's pretty much the response they gave before, and that doesn't really answer the question. It just says, yeah, it's going to continue to meet demand for the future, okay, but that, does that mean you're making more or not? And to be honest, the answer is probably no, because it doesn't really make a lot of sense, as I've already discussed. So, again, take this a pinch of salt until it's confirmed by AMD, but I would be surprised if this report wasn't accurate in all honesty, because, again, the 5700 XT and 5700 vanilla basically render this whole GPU not, not pointless, that's not really the right word, but you know, again, other than the compute increases and a few other bits, the XT is a better buy. So, wait and see on this one, but I think eventually once the current stock runs out, we probably will get a report that yes, it is officially end of life. So, let's finish things up with a little bit of an update regarding Ryzen. So the other day I discussed the issue of the Ryzen 3000 boost clocks and how they haven't been meeting some of the advertised clocks on all cases. Now obviously, as some of you pointed out in the comments, as I've asked you to, um, you are able to reach the advertised boost clocks, which, you know, as I said before, silicon lottery is a thing, obviously the cooling setup you've got and airflow, all of that, all those variables do matter when it comes to this sort of thing. But obviously Intel were kind of calling AMD out a little bit on this and really say slide. Again, you can see my video from the other day um, to, just, to see exactly what Intel had to say about this. But we now have a bit of an update from an ASUS employer Shimino who made a post on Overclock.net as to why Ryzen 3000 is having issues hitting advertised clock speed. And he said, quote, every new BIOS I get asked a boost question all over again. I have not tested a newer version of a GISA that changes the current state of 10.03 boost, not even 10.04. If I do know of changes, I will specifically state this. They were being too aggressive with the boost previously. The current boost behavior is more in line with their confidence in long-term reliability, and I have not heard of any changes to this stance, though I have more of a more customizable version in the future. Now interestingly alongside this there was also a post from a fellow by the name of The Stilt and you can find both posts linked in the description below this video and they basically said that they were able to take a look at the temperature part of the boost algorithm for Ryzen 3000 so the long and short of his post which you can see on screen is that basically that the high temperature limit has been reduced and the middle temperature limit has also been introduced as well. So basically AMD reduced the max temperature for boost clocks to 75 degrees and added in a lower middle temperature limit that unfortunately if you want to override that you have to void your warranty. So basically it seems that AMD have reduced the boost clocks, uh, stock boost clocks should I say, uh, to avoid damaging their processors. Maybe they got over a bit overzealous or maybe they just weren't overly confident that People weren't going to be damaging their processors with most cooling setups. It's very, very possible. Obviously, if you're confident in your cooling setup and you're confident that you know, you're know you not going to regret voiding your warranty, obviously you can try and get around this. But that's apparently, according to this statement from ASUS, the reason as to why we're having these issues. Now, obviously, the motherboards are also playing a factor, as many of you pointed out. So I'm aware of that, of course. Um, but still interesting to see that temperature is also playing a part here. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated, and I'll see you next time.